Lime Chat, and I, Time Shortages is my business, and I help people figure out what to do with their stuff. Um, and that's why we're going to talk about it. Uh, one of the big things that I get um, is uh, people are overwhelmed. And we're all overwhelmed about um, you know, our garages, our guest rooms, our not so guest rooms, um, our, our attics, hopefully not, our basements. They're just everything's stuffed with things. And there's a reason for that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the reason, and then we're going to talk about how to fix that. And um, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm working with like 12 screens. Like, this is going to be fun. All right, we'll see if we can move this along. All right, so um, being a historian, I always like to try to figure out what the problem is. You know, there's a problem that we're all working with. And the problem is obviously too much stuff. But how do we get there? Well, there is a historic reason for where we are. Um, it pretty much started uh, World War II, and um, up until this time, uh, people didn't collect a whole lot of stuff. Everybody sort of passed along the same core of information, items that they had in the family, you know, heirlooms, right? They're called heirlooms. We call it stuff now, uh, but it was heirlooms at one time. And the reason it's stuff now is because it's actually, we had a point where we had a lot of money to spend. We just got done with the war. Um, as you see here, the wages had doubled, unemployment was down, the average income increased. Um, the other thing about World War II for us is that we were not, it, it didn't hit our home, right? I mean, it, it didn't come to our, our land for the most part. And so we had our factories up and running. Uh, we've always had them up and running, but they would immediately switch to, to materials that um, you know, people would use every day, nylons, plastic. Uh, a lot of the, the um, silicone, a lot of the things that came out of the war became products for us to buy. All right, so the other thing is that happened is post-World War II, it was a peak of home ownership. Now, I, that chart is really small and it really doesn't matter because what it's showing, those two lines going up is the average size of a house. Okay, that's, it, it went up that quickly. Um, the line going down is the size of the family. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're going like that. Um, which means that we've got a lot more space. What do we do when we have space? Fill it up. Fill it. Fill it up because guess what? We got stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got a problem rolling here. So then, if you go on, we had it. We had this this lovely euphoric. Uh, I'm going to buy things. I'm going to get my wedding. We're going to have these big weddings, right? We're going to buy the china. We're going to buy the, you know, the 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 furniture. They call it brown furniture now which is what that means, is it just means it's made out of real wood and it's heavy. Uh, but nobody wants the brown furniture anymore, right? They, we had all of these things that we got, uh, and it was traditional. In fact, I got married um, 33 years ago, something like that, and uh, 32. And at the time, I was like, okay, everybody's like, you gotta register for your china pattern. I'm like, okay, great. Um, I got one set, and that was it. <laughs> I never had time, I mean, it was like, why did I do this? And I did it because everybody before me did it. My mom did it, you know. I mean, it was just, it was part of that whole rush of getting stuff. It, it, we became uh, collectors. Up until this time, as I said, you would have like not ready-made items, you know, you had things that you passed along because it took a lot of time to make them and all that sort of thing. We're talking pre industrial revolution. But this stuff was actually bearing down on us. So this is it, we, we've got the problem of we're collectors. But here's the challenge. These, all of these articles were done in 2017 because all of a sudden people, um, journalism's got a hold of this idea of nobody wants your stuff, right? Yeah, we all hear that, right? I mean, it's like a thing that, oh, my kids don't want my stuff. Do they have gossip? Well, no. It, the articles tell me they don't want it. Oh, my granddaughter told me I don't want it. <laughs> you don't want it. And, and in some cases they say don't want it, and that's fine. I mean, but there's a, there's a very specific thing that we're talking about here. More of the challenge, the red bars are baby boomers, okay? My, my husband's at the end of baby boomers. Baby boomers turn 60 next year, all right? That's, that is going to be, in no time, we're gonna all be in, a, in a, uh, the age group of retirement, all right? So we're getting rid of our stuff, but our parents are still alive. <laughs> They're getting rid of their stuff, right? Now we've had something unprecedented in history. Two generations all getting rid of their stuff. Okay, this is, nobody, it's like the flow down is just stopped, right? And then, and then you get to the next generation and they're like, you know, I don't want any of it, get rid of it, don't talk to me. 
Also, the things that we want to give, the things that matter to us in our hearts, are things that are like going right up there. You've got your, your, your mementos and your collections. We call them tchotchkes sometimes. China dishes, furniture, and then photos and paper, right? Anybody got any photo albums? More than 10? <laughs> Do you know, recently I saw on Facebook, somebody posted, a nice young person posted, I guess this is the same as my mother's photo albums, and she showed a scroll of her photos on her phone that are totally unorganized. And she went, I guess this is the same thing. It's like, yes it is, all right? So the things we want to give away are substantial on that side. And the things that I might want to take, maybe specific mementos, photos and paper, maybe, you know, maybe somebody's like, that, that's kind of a cool picture of the ship dad served on or granddad served on or, you know, so they, they're picking, right? They're cherry picking the things that they want. All right, and you can see that it's, it's just not a good idea. We're all there going, but they, I can't let my history die. I can't let my family history die, you know, whatever. Uh, I think they may run into the problem where um, you, you have this idea of something you want to give somebody, like a kids or something, and you're like, ah, it's here, here this, and they're like, I don't want that. But I want that ugly fish plate that you were gonna throw out, right? Okay, so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. All right. So what are your options? You organize and curate your own history, and you talk before you toss and dump or donate. Here's the thing, they don't want your history, sort of. You know what they don't want? They don't want that avalanche of boxes of stuff that you don't even know what you got. It, right? Yeah, do y'all know what you, do you know what you got at home? Yeah, you got the big boxes. You're like, well, there's, there's something, I. I think there's something over here in this box. Oh wait, it's not in that box. Oh, no wait, okay, no. Oh, no, it's not in that box either. Where did I put, oh, it's probably in one of the 20 boxes, either in such a room or somewhere, yeah, somewhere else, right? This is how we're living. No wonder your kids don't want that. They don't even know what it is. It doesn't matter to them. Clearly, it doesn't matter to you because you haven't taken care of it either. And the correlation I bring to this is something like when you go into a museum. You ever go into a museum and, they, and this, is, this is a museum of, of us, right? You walk in and you're like, oh, it's really good to meet you. Oh, welcome to my museum. Okay, in that room there's a whole bunch of boxes. Not sure what's in there, so feel free. Um, down the corner, we got another bundle of boxes. Over here there's some great photos, I think. Okay, this is, this is uh, the museum we're offering. You don't go into museums that way. What do they do? They go in and they have the presentation. I'm not suggesting you go put a bunch of poster boards up. I, but you, you need to understand what history you have. You need to be able to tell them how it matters to you. It doesn't matter to you, it's not gonna matter to them. They're not gonna go, yeah, give me that whole box of stuff. I'll rifle through it, sure. It doesn't matter to them, it matters to you. So that's what we talk about curating your own history. Understand the things that matter to you and why. You don't bother doing that don't be surprised, it's not gonna go anywhere. It shouldn't go anywhere. You know the stories, you know the relevance. You need to make that happen. And you wanna talk before you toss or donate. You need to talk to the family. You don't wanna just go, hey, I, I saved this thing for you. Appreciate me and the history. It's really cool, right? And like I said, they'll come back to you and go, you know what's really important? That really ugly fish platter that nobody ever liked because I remembered it when I was a kid. That's where my history is. We all have touchstones in our history, don't we? We have things that have the energy of our history. You can't decide what that is for your family members. That is not your job. Your job is to share with them the history behind the things that you have so that they can connect to it somehow. In my house, my mom was like, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, your grandmother left some rings. I'm not quite sure, it's kind of, you know, not how to do this. And I said, do you have that little balsa wood Swiss chalet music box that you and dad picked up when you lived in Germany for a while? She's like, yeah, yeah, I think it's somewhere around here. And I said, that's what I want. Because that's what I spent time, that was what I was fascinated with a kid, as a kid. She said, it's just like a little balsa wood. Oh, it's the coolest thing. You know, I had one of those little spinners with those spikies on it, right, that played the little, right? As a kid, I sat for hours pushing on it. <laughs> it's, it's a wonder the thing works. But I'd be like, oh, this is really cool how this works. 
to me, that is a part of my heart and a part of my past that my mother would never have guessed. Had she thrown it out, I probably would have been a, a bit disappointed. Um, so understand what's important to the family members that you have. Understand where their history is and the stuff that you might have. Make sure you know where to get your hands on it. That's the stuff that they're gonna want. That's the stuff that's gonna be important to them. Your history is yours, their history, is going to be theirs. That's part of the that's part of the key. So talk to them before you decide you're going to do anything. But sometimes it's easier said than done. And here's why. This is like the the hoop of shame. <laughs> okay. This is because this is because these are the things that keep us from being able to do what I just said we need to do. Right. Legacy items. Oh, that's a killer. You got to have this because everybody in front of you had that. <laughs> Look, really. Yeah, okay. So it's a legacy item. It's something that your grandparents had. It's something, you know, your mother had, your parents, your grandparents, your grandparents. Oh, that's great. It's a legacy item. But again, if it's not something they want, that's okay. Okay? You've got to let go of that legacy thing. Memories and emotions. Memories and emotions, we feel our history, don't we? I mean, even the, even the I'm an emotional person. I really am disgustingly emotional. Uh, but even the most unemotional person, when they get a piece of the history, something that matters to their heart, uh, it's hard to let go and it's hard to understand why somebody might not want that. I mean, how appalling is that? This is the thing that means the most to me. How can you not want that? We take that personally, don't we? We take that absolutely to heart. You don't want my history. I want your history. You take it. You keep it. Perceived value. This has been a killer. Antiques Roadshow. You know, American Pickers, we're gonna run out there and throw a dollar value on all your history. Yes, Sariba. So people are like, oh, I don't wanna throw that away. I might have a, like a hidden $2 million something here, somewhere. I just don't know where, so I can't throw anything away because if I throw anything away, somebody's gonna dig it out of the trash and they're gonna show up on Antiques Roadshow and it's gonna be mine and I'm gonna miss out on that money. The kids will miss out on the money. We, you know, I can't get my motor home that I'm gonna retire in, and, all right? It, it, trust me, how many people now look at any object of historic value and just wonder in the back of their head, what's that money? You ever do that? What do we say when we see something of historic value? Oh, I bet you that's worth a lot. Okay? That, that has clouded entirely all of our thinking about our history stuff. Because we're fear that we're going to miss out, that we're going to be the one that throws away that $4 million painting that we didn't know we had. It turns out it's a Picasso. Who knew? Okay. If it's a Picasso, call me. I'll be your friend. Gifts. Um, my favorite story about my gifts is that, okay, I'm married 32 years. Um, I still, until this move out to um, Stafford, I, I still had lead glass picture frames. Every wedding has a thing, right? There's some people that like went through the fondue wedding gift thing where everybody got a fondue set. You're like, what? <coughs> Mine was large, oversized, heavy lead crystal fr picture frames. I mean, really, I don't have the, I don't have the grand piano with a large roof to even put the suckers on. I mean, then some of these were like this, you know, uh, one of them we used to call the brick affectionately. The thing was about five inches thick. I mean, the picture was probably like a three by three or something, but this, this crystal, you know, whatever brick we used it as a door stop for a very long time. But I, I couldn't believe I actually had all the picture frames that I got. Because you know what? It's a gift. What is our fear about giving away gifts? They're going to find out. They're going to find out. Are you re gifted to them? Yeah. They're going to find out. Even though I've moved six times since I was married, two different states, and it's been 32 years ago, but they're going to know. They are going to know. And I'm going to get it re-gifted, and I'm going to be caught, right? I, chances are they don't even know what they gave me. Chances are they, they bought off of the, some gift registry somewhere, and they don't even know. But we have that fear, gifts. So you've got to hang on to it just in case they catch you, right? That's not really a natural fear, but it is, it's there. Personal identity. We put ourselves in the things we own, don't we? Do you know what I mean by that? Like you... Your, your, your presence, your, your existence is in the thing. And, and it's hard to let go of them. 
And it's hard to think that your kids aren't going to love that, or your other family members aren't going to be like just falling over themselves to get the stuff that represents you. So the big one in the middle is fears and pressures, and that's really all of those. It keep, all of those things at various times in our world keeps us from dealing with all of our family history stuff, all of it. You need to fight through it. You need to work through all of the questions. So how are we going to move forward? I like this. I did this picture a long time ago because you see at the very far distance off in the horizon is, is where we think we are going. We're over there sorting through our stuff, not really sorting, but just loving on our stuff, packing it and taking care of it and making sure it doesn't get damaged and we don't even know what it is, you know, it's been packed for so long. I found actual real tissue paper from like the wedding on one of those things. It was, like, it was probably the year 25 mark. I took it out. It never been out of the box. It's a lot of tissue paper. Okay. Um, so we need to get some perspective. We need to be able to close that gap. So here's some useful questions for you. This is a big one. Is this your memory to keep? When you're looking at an item, I got my item right here. Is this my history to keep? This is going to you all who have kids, okay? Are you hanging on to your kids' history for them? Are you hanging on to things because you're gonna to try to design their, their family histories, right? Their, their, their self-worth, as we talked originally, their, their historic worth. Is it yours to hang on to? If it's not your history, okay? If you've got your kids' drawings, you know, your kids' uh, report cards, their toys. Um, you're hanging on to um, a box of Aunt Sally stuff because, well, she died, she left it to you, all right? Is it your history? If it isn't, you need to consider moving on, okay? So that's the first question you ask yourself. Is it yours to hang on to in the first place? This is a big one, too. Does the item or items in your family history, the things you're hanging on to, does it actually speak without you? I mean, if you're, if, yes, we're all going to live forever, so I'm not. It's not a big, nobody in here, but when you're gone, is somebody going to go? Oh, I know what this meant to. I mean, I know what this meant to Terry. This was really important, and this is why, and everything's really. I understand why I have this thing. Okay. Or is it going to be one of those things where they look at it and they go, God, I don't even know where that thing came from. It's hideous. It's hideous. I don't know. God bless you. I don't even know what it's about. I... So if it can't talk without you, it's specifically your history. It's something that, that speaks to you. And again, unless you share it, that's where it's going to stay. Is it a memory that has relevance beyond yourself? All right, so now I know the story of, of Aunt Sally's pin here. I understand that story really well. Is it, did I meet Aunt Sally? Do I, do I even know anything about her? Has my family ever told me anything about Aunt Sally? No. You know, I don't need that. <laughs> okay? Without those connections that only you guys can provide, people are not going to understand that connection, and it's not going to matter. That history is not going to matter. So let's say you go through all the questions and you still have your stuff. You've been really good, you went through it, you curated it. And y'all know what curating is, by the way? Curating is basically looking at something and understanding that there's a story and what that story is and the relevance, and in this case, of your life, okay? So basically, it's something that you can sort through. If you say you don't know where something came from, but it came from somebody that's long past, that's my, that's your first clue that needs to move on, okay? But again, so if you are gone through and you've curated your stuff, you know what you have, you've had those conversations with your family members, and if you still don't have the, I mean, if, if they take everything, call me, because that never happens. It never, ever happens, okay? Because your history, some element of your history is gonna go with you. God willing, it's a long time from now. But it's going to go with you, okay? There are parts of this world and this history that is just for you to take, and that's it. it we don't have to like. We don't have to make sure that everybody in here knows every story about my life, uh, so that I can, you know, that that's not that's not the important part. That's some of that's just my history. 
Some of it's going to be your history. So a lot of people, when they deal with um, trying to move on their stuff, you've had those great conversations. You now know what you're going to do with your brown furniture um, on your, in your uh, 12 sets of china. I mean, I've got, I've got beautiful hand-blown glass from my great-grandmother. I have no idea what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> it is so fragile. You can't use it. Uh, maybe I'll just have it use it once and maybe I'll do the toast and chuck them around. I don't know. Um, but there's some options. Now you've got to figure out what to do. And the reason these pictures are up there is because that's not what you're going to do with it. Uh, what's the fr first thing everybody says when they're going to do with it? Goodwill. I'm going to go take that to Goodwill. That thing's going to find a good home. <coughs> there is somebody that's been knocking down Goodwill's door to get this thing right here that I got in my hand. This here 40 year old waffle maker. It is the best waffle maker around. It. It's got great memories on this waffle maker. There's going to be somebody who's going to want this. Right? We do. We think that, don't we? You're wrong. You're just dead wrong. Okay? Goodwill stores, especially since the pandemic, because what did a lot of people do with, during the pandemic? I'll just sit here and go through my stuff. Right? Pan oh, Goodwill is overrun. Salvation Army is overrun. Uh, the, you've got it said the two generations, they're all getting rid of their stuff, right? So that's not a good option. It's not a viable option. And I'll tell you, Goodwill ends up paying a lot of money to throw, their, to throw away things that, that a lot of people leave that are not useful, that are not current, that waffle maker doesn't work, <laughs> you know. Uh, you can kind of go, well, maybe the person that's going to buy this waffle maker is going to be able to repair this waffle maker because it doesn't work, right? We, what's the phrase that, that grandmothers always use? It's still good. It's still good. You know, it's got all the most of the paint on it. Still, it's good. It's really good. It's still useful. We can't throw that away. All right. Depression's over. Just it's clearing up here. Totally over. Don't don't go there. But the Salvation Army Goodwill Savers, don't go there. What are you going to do with them? All right. You've got thirty-five thousand museums and historic societies. So far, a recent date. Do they want all your stuff? No, they're going to want, want. They're not going to want your waffle irons. Just right there. But if you talk to the historic societies, find out what their mission is, what story they're telling, what is the thing that they're the, mes the message you're trying to get out, and let them know what you have. Sometimes there's a connection. Sometimes there's a connection. If 40-year-old waffle maker, that's great, but maybe it's the historic society where they, those things are being manufactured. Heck, I'd take that, right? Because I don't have to use the waffle iron to clean it before you bring it over, but I don't, I'm not going to use it. It's going to be part of the story we tell. So this is an important thing. Other thing I'll tell you, as a, as a museum professional, don't dump and run. No midnight deliveries. No sliding the box. <laughs> You know, with the kittens in it or something by the door, right? And then just like driving off. It'll find a good home. Call them. Talk to them. Find out. If you've got your ancestors' stuff, this generation is not like, well, previous generations are not like this generation. They grew up, lived, and died in the same town more often than not. Right? Go find out what town they lived in. Go donate those photos from those random photos of people standing in front of plants and things in their yard. Go, go donate those things to the local society that they came from, those families. They don't care that they don't know the people in your photos. But they like the buildings. They like the, the, the dress of the people. It tells the story, and it's from that community. All right? So check those out. Also, 119,000 libraries. What? Where do you get the book? Yes, they also usually collect local history items, mostly paper, okay? But they can also connect you with a historic society that might be looking for that item that you have, okay? You have to do a little work, though, okay? You have to take the time, all right? Because otherwise, landfill, here it comes. All right. The other thing you can do is you can capture them. Now, I, I put this picture up because there's somebody typing on a computer screen, and, and some of my older friends are like, I don't want to do it. Okay, you know what? Knock yourself out. Pen and ink still work. Capture your stories. My father's 88. I've annoyed him for the last decade trying to get him to tell me stories of the family. 
Um, and that's really what, that's the richness of the history, right? That's the bit of history that you want to make sure you catch. Now, in this room, I guarantee you, in somebody's head, they're going, eh, my history isn't interesting. Nobody's going to want to know about me, said your grandmother, said your great-grandmother, said your great-great. I'm just a simple person living a simple life, you know? That's the stuff they want to know about. So capture it. What else can you do if you're not a writer? Well, you can get out your iPad or your, uh, what's the other version? Anyway, you can get out your electronics and do with them. You can also use your phone. Hey, just sitting here thinking about grandma. Let me tell you a little story about grandma, what she used to do, right? Those are the treasures of history, not the waffle iron, okay? All right. You can also organize it and preserve it. Now, this is the fun part. This is where I do my work. I come to people's houses and they're like, I've got all these boxes. My most recent one was 47 boxes, which is on the light side for most of us, right? 47 boxes, and it was a scramble. And I spent a long time organizing it. This guy was a uh, World War II vet. That's kind of cool. He actually served under MacArthur. He was part of the Army Corps of Engineers that, that developed a lot of the Southeast Asia landing uh, areas, okay, all, all across the islands. He was written for or wrote for books. He served as a commissioner for Washington, D.C. before they had, uh, before 1954 or something around there, they had actually, oh, the 60, they had actually, they would run Washington, D.C. with three people. They all know that? Who knew that? See, and you don't know that. Oh, yep, there you go. So basically, he was one of the three commissioners that, that basically then was replaced ultimately by the mayor, right? So he's kind of a junior mayor. He had all this great history stuff. It was an absolute appalling mess. Photos, about three to 5,000 photos this guy had because he was over in Okinawa. He went over to Okinawa after the war to help rebuild it because, again, Army Corps of Engineers. He made it to uh, Major General, right? Big deal. Okay, so here's the thing. His stuff was as big a mess as any of yours in here. That's absolutely. And all it took was a bit of sorting. And what we ultimately found out is he had rare photos that nobody's ever seen. Isn't that cool? He had photos from the surrender on Missouri. So usually when you go and see the so it, it, history interest, anybody, anybody interested here? Okay. So you know there's like usually two pictures of the Missouri stuff, right? There's a one from the side where MacArthur's sitting at the table, and the, and the uh, Japanese emissary is standing across from it. It's a side angle, right? That one I've seen a lot. The other one I've seen is kind of an aerial shot, kind of surrounded by um, sailors, and they're looking down on the, the whole table and the whole presentation thing. Turns out that was only two images from a set of about 50. He had the other 48. How cool. They didn't know they had it. You know why? They didn't know what they had in those boxes, right? Those things now are going to be going uh, to the um, Army Heritage Center, and they're going to be put on a website, they're going to be somebody, they're going to be shared, okay? I only tell you all that because there are gems in all of your history here. And I kind of make fun of it a little bit with the wildfire, but you all have pieces of the big puzzle of what, of what Stafford is, of what living is, of what the era is that you're from. But you all need to do a little bit of work to get that diamond out of the rough, right? You need to really look at what you have and understand. And then, like I said, you can preserve it. You can just organize it. You can um, put it in shadow boxes. It can be digitized. Oh my goodness, I digitized. So many photos and slides. Anybody still have slides? Oh, God bless you. Uh, the most I have, uh, the, he had 60, 60 carousels of 100 slides a piece. I'm like, you sure you want those all? <laughs> These are not all really good here. And he's like, no, no, I want them. He worked for the CIA. And he, had, he, was, he was all over the world, and he had pictures he wanted to remember, and his kids wanted to remember. And that's kids didn't, the kids didn't want the 60 <coughs> carousels of slides. But they wanted the images. So we made sure that they got that done. So, what do you need to do? I'm sorry, I don't have a silver bullet. If you were coming to go, Terry's going to tell me exactly what to do with my stuff. I can tell you, I can guide you to get there. But this is the thing. This is the hard story here. Nobody can do anything but you. And, but there's people out there that can help. People like myself, people like historic societies, people like libraries. But take stock of the, stock of the history that you have, 
and know what you have and why. Why do you still have it? If you can't answer that, you might want to consider moving it on. Ask yourself those three important questions. Is this your memory to keep? Are you hanging on to somebody else's history for them? Stop it. No, right? That's not your job here. That's time to, it's time to send those, those baby pictures and, the, <laughs> and the, the school papers and the whatever you got that belongs to kids or to other. Let the family know what you have and see who's interested in actually hanging on to those things if it's not you. If you weren't here, does the item tell that memory? Can it speak for itself? After you're gone, if they're going to look at that waffle iron and wonder why you ever kept that, that's kind of a loss, right? And then is it a memory that is relevant beyond yourself? And if it doesn't, then you really need to consider the fact that that's where that history stops. And that's okay, too. You can't pass it all on. You shouldn't pass it all on. I have some really great memories, but if I go to somebody and share my great memories, they're going to be bored to tears. It's not going to matter. That's my world. So we have to quit feeling that need to make sure that all of our stories go to everybody and that it's all being kept. It's not how that works. And finally, consider donating, but do it sparingly. All right? don't, be, don't be dumping on somebody else. Capture the history in a different way. Write it down. Record a tape. Record a video. Actually, the coolest thing in the world, somebody recorded my grandfather. I don't even know what he, he was talking about. I don't know what. I heard his voice. I have never met the man. That is cool. That's the cool stuff of history. All right? And then organize, preserve, or for heaven's sake, to use it. And that's what I need to do. I need to get Grandma's uh, fine crystal out. Uh, maybe New Year's. They have a nice toast. If it breaks, it breaks. But um, enjoy the stuff that you have as well. We put it away and we hang on to it like it's some sort of talisman. And actually, it's the stuff of life. So make sure you're using that as well. So doing all of these things is going to help us restore a little balance. It's going to help, help us want to donate or shove down to the next generation a lot less. We're going to be responsible and deciding how it is that we move our history forward. We're going to do it deliberately and with thought. Because I guarantee you, the kids who say they don't want your history, they want the stuff that's important in your history. They don't want the boxes that you've got. So help them get there and save the important part of your history. And if you need help, I'm always around. I'm happy to give out my contact information. And uh, I'm not a taxi. I don't charge to uh, talk. I'm happy to give anybody advice and information that they need. My final thought is by giving and sharing thoughtful consideration about your family history items, you'll help the next generation understand the importance of the history and allow them to receive and keep that history in a way that works for everybody. And that's it. <laughs>